This is the final video in my three week car counting trip in the southern states of America. In this video, you'll see me make some pretty major strategy changes, as well as dealing with a pit boss on a power trip and having an unbelievable final session. But first, we were in for a rough start. Yesterday, we made a $10,000 mistake. And making a mistake that costs you $10,000 is is much more painful than playing the game well and losing $10,000. So here's what happened. Yesterday, a teammate of mine, we're gonna call him Player for the sake of this. Player found a particularly interesting blackjack game. Not all blackjack games are created equally. Some of them have special weird rules. Some of them use lots of decks of cards. Some of them use a few. There's all these little differences that can change how the game works. And every now and again, we'll come across one that's quite unusual. And that's what Player found. He found this unusual game and he really wanted to give it a crack. So he was posting in the chat saying, can I do this game? Now our team manager's asleep. A lot of people are asleep. It was just me and uh, an investor that was awake. And this investor is incredibly knowledgeable about blackjack. The info he gives us is just incredibly useful. The knowledgeable investor said, okay, yeah, it's probably worth a crack if you want. And only now have I just woken up and looked at the group chat and been caught up and seen that he overlooked a rule in this game. Well, that, with that rule, the game is unbeatable. And we all thought he was probably going to get about five minutes before a back off. However, he went on to play for hours and lose $10,000. So all that time, he was playing with the disadvantage. <sighs> okay. I wasn't mad at him as I saw this as a team error. We as the team set the rules and we didn't have any rules or policy in place that would stop this kind of mistake from happening. So I feel like we all share some of the responsibility. But since this moment, we've been able to do some further number crunching and we found that we actually technically did have a very small edge. It's just that the game is way more volatile than we would have liked. So in reality, the mistake wasn't too crucial, but at the time it felt like we'd set $10,000 on fire. But hey, at least none of us had actually set any money on fire. So this is a picture of some of the money that I set on fire. I'd carry my camera batteries in my money belt because I didn't want to leave batteries in a hot car. I was just worried about them setting on fire. But somehow, and the battery manufacturer has no idea how this happened, one of the batteries caught fire whilst I was in a casino and as a result, burned a tiny hole through some of the money. I didn't even realize this until hours later when I was getting my cash out. So in a weird way, it's a bit like in a movie where someone's got a Bible in their pocket and someone fires a gun at them and then the bullet hits the Bible and it saves their life. Well, for me, a wad of money stopped me getting burnt by fire. To Vicksburg, I traveled, stopping off at Harlow's Casino on the way. Harlow's had a table maximum of just $300. Given that I'd been playing the whole trip with $100 minimums and $1,000 maximums, this wasn't ideal. However, I had a plan. I'd play three hands at once, betting $15 a hand. At a true one, I'd bet $100 a hand, a true two, $200 a hand, and at a true three, $300 a hand. It still wouldn't be a super profitable game, but it was the best I could do given the circumstances. Also, I was really excited about the idea of playing three hands at once, that was a uh, new and novel, and I was thrilled about it. It was also refreshing to not worry about looking like a card counter. I was there to play as quickly and as efficiently as possible, no subtlety at all. When I started, I immediately caught a high count. As soon as I raised my bet, I got a lot of heat, but it still took them around 20 minutes before they backed me off. Oh, we're gonna have to back you off our game. Okay. So, play's too good. We don't sure. want to put too small. For, yeah, no worries. For what you're doing. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Thanks. Nice. $652.50 in winnings onwards. Vicksburg did not treat me well. So I was just playing at Waterview Casino and then I noticed at one point the pit boss having a chat with the casino manager and explaining that at one point I was betting this and then I was betting this. He then watches the table for a bit and as soon as I put out my two bets of 800 hands, $1,600 total, he stops the table and then comes over to me and says, and of course I say, uh, I'm fine, thank you. I don't want to show my ID. And he says, well, you can't play blackjack then. Do you have some ID on you? Not that I'd like to show. Okay, well, then you can't game anymore. You can't okay. play blackjack. Sure. Okay. So I get up and I walk to the cash desk and I immediately announce I don't have ID. I wanted to do that before pushing the chips over because I didn't want to risk them taking the chips, like pushing them over and then saying I don't have ID and then them withholding the chips. Some casinos might do that. I don't want to give my name. Then the casino manager comes back over and then this exchange happens. How are you doing, sir? I'm good. Good. Me again, what you got? Under 4K, just 3950. Uh-huh. Yeah, I see your ID, right? Yes. 
you want to give them to them. No. They got to have your ID with money like that. Mm, no, they don't. I just said they do. Yeah. On face, on, by, why? You can have the chips if you want them. Right. We'll speed this up. We'll speed this up. You, you legally have to cash me out. No, I don't legally have to. Stop telling me that. Stop trying to intimidate me. I'm not trying okay? to intimidate you. I've been doing this for 30 years. Yes. You know how many people like you I've seen? Loads. And I know, I know we're in the South. Yeah. And I know it's a little slow. But I don't have to cash you out. Okay? You, legally, you do, though. No, I don't. How come? So th this is private property. Sure. This is a privately owned property, yep. and I do not 100%. have to cash you out. Yes, but there's an implied contract between and the patron. You know who you are. If you want to take a damn of that, and you want to go through that, that's between you and them. I'm going to let you cash your money out, because I'm not up. I'm giving you your money back. I just want to point out what a proper flex that was. I'll let you cash out your chips. And isn't it wild that that's the language that they, the casino can use? Let you, as if they have a right to not do it. There is an implied contract between the casino and the patron, and that involves cashing them out. They can't just make up rules. Now, I don't know if the guy realizes that it's illegal for him to not, or if he just doesn't care. You know my thoughts on this already. I'm going to hit another casino nearby. The casino nearby was Riverwalk. They caught on very fast. Within 10 minutes, I was approached. So I just played fat bit. Okay. I start out that was a weird situation. They come over to do the back off and they just tell me that they're going to flat bet me at $100, one hand. How'd you get me so fast? Don't worry about it, I got you. Oh, I'm intrigued. Did he know me already? Or the other casino? You like this, don't you? And I'm sort of trying to joke with them a bit, be like, how'd you get me? Because it was almost 10 minutes. So I wanted to know if the other casino had sent my uh, face over or if they just knew me or whatever it was. I wanted to know why they got me so quick. But they won't give me anything. They're being very serious. Fine. So you do one hand at $100? Oh, I'm good, I'm good. Thank you. So I sit down at the table. The count is pretty high, so I'm like, well, I might as well play the $100 one hand until the count drops. Try and get a little bit of EV. And then I, so I chuck over three purple chips, which are $500 a piece, to break them into hundreds. Black, please. Purple company. And she's immediately like, no, no, don't break those chips. What about $100 a hand? Yeah, but can I not get more? All right, let's go. All right, I'm just doing what you guys said. <laughs> I'm just like, why? And I'm like, you said a hundred a hand. You said one hand a hundred dollars. And she goes, you've got hundreds. I'm like, what's wrong with breaking them? She goes, okay, back him off. But then when I got to the cash desk, I just went, I don't have ID, is that okay? And they went, yeah, and then they cashed me out. So what was with the purples issue? I just wanted to play a hundred dollars one hand. At least I get this view. Stunning. So I lost $1,650 in Vicksburg. Before we get to the final casino on the trip, do you remember when I said this? By the end of the trip, someone would send me something far better. Well, I can now reveal to you what was sent to me. It's an email, and I think it's best if I just read it out to you. Hello. I probably shouldn't be contacting you, but as a fan of your videos, I wanted to reach out. I work in surveillance at the casino you visited this morning. I was observing your gameplay for some time, but didn't plan to interfere until the pit called up. If you have any questions about what gave you away or other casinos nearby worth visiting, I'd be happy to answer them. Apologies for the back off. A fan. This casino surveillance person knew I was counting and then deliberately didn't turn me in. They waited until they were specifically asked to run down my game, at which point they had no choice. But I just wanted to take a moment to say, I did try and email you back, but I never heard from you. So if you're watching this video, thank you so much. I really appreciate you letting me get the time in. My new system for the extra cash is to take it and put it in a sock. No one's gonna mug my socks. I had one day left, one day before the end of the trip. I was ready to give it my all, but the last day of the trip always makes me nervous. Back in our Vegas trip, I remember having three losing sessions in a row where I lost over $40,000, and that was just in six hours of playing time. All the playing, training, and preparation to end up only just breaking even. I remember how that felt, to have such a massive high from winning, and then to hit such a low. It was unlikely that that would happen again, but that's the thing with card counting. Over the long run, you're pretty likely to win a lot of money, but in the short term, you're just flipping coins and crossing your fingers. The High Limit Room back at La Verge, the first casino I'd played at on the trip, and settled in for the most intense session of the trip. The first hour was a slow grind. Rebuy, rebuy, rebuy. Every time I started building up a nice pile of chips, I'd lose a few big hands and be reaching in my pocket to get out more cash. Change 300. 
Three blades up. Thank you. Get back to even, please. Over the next hour, things started to pick up. I was winning hand after hand, and before I knew it, I had a nice pile of purple and black chips on the table. Oh, two, yes, <laughs> that's great. Oh, yeah, come on, look at that. I want to take a picture of that. I won more and more hands, and I realized I had to be up at least 10K. I've been playing for about four hours, and if I left at that moment, I could end the trip on a high. And I really wanted that. The whole team wanted that. There's no better feeling in blackjack than when you end a trip at the peak of your graph. But in card counting, there's no such thing as quitting while you're ahead. But I know from experience, there's been many sessions where I've been up thousands and given it all back in just a few hands but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't tempted to leave early. I wanted to secure the win. Just when I was really considering it, the decision was made for me. Yes, fair enough. It's yeah, yeah it's time. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank okay. you. You're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome to play whatever, anything else yeah. is on blood check. You actually don't know how much money I've dropped here <laughs> in the down. Oh, so, thank <laughs> so. <laughs> thanks for being so polite. I appreciate it. I knew that was coming. I was like, there's no way. I was like, with those chips on the table, there's no way. I'm like, oh, I'm flying home tomorrow. Where are you from? Uh, England. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is a lovely casino though, by the way. Given how relaxed the back off was, I was expecting a hassle-free cash out. After all, I was gonna hand over my ID, so why would there be a problem? Hey, how are you? Good yourself. Yeah, I'm good. So this is a fun job for you, because the UK thing makes this complicated. <laughs> No problem. Well, there was a problem. They wanted my social security number, which I don't have because I'm not American. That is not a thing. <laughs> Sometimes staff get a bit confused with how to cash me out when it's over 10K. They usually have me fill out a CTR form, even though that form assumes that I'm an American. Now, most of the time when this happens, they'll just scan my passport, get me to write down my personal details, and then sign a blank piece of paper. But in this case, she wasn't confident that that was enough, and she didn't want to cash me out without a manager. What, right, as in right now? <laughs> I, I, I need to do it now. I'm leaving the country tomorrow. But the manager wasn't in, so she wanted to push this whole thing back until tomorrow, which didn't work for me because I was flying to Miami the next day. Not to mention that it isn't legal for them to delay the cash out procedure. That's not my fault that they don't have the staff there, that they don't even need because they should know how to cash someone out. That I was in a situation where I was potentially going to get stuck with tens of thousands of dollars of chips. Luckily, someone did arrive and they had me fill out the CTR form the best I could. Weirdly, they were determined to get me to sign the US person box, even though I'm not from the US. But hey, at least I got my money. I had a security guy escort me to the car. A lot of people had seen how much I'd cashed out. And I finally got to count my money and see how much I'd won. $19,000 session. I had a $19,000 session. I am buzzing. I was internally begging them to back me off because I wanted to end on a high. And eventually they did. $19,000. $19,000. I think that's the biggest win of the trip. <sighs> Feels great. I can't wait for the team to see. One final session from my teammate with winnings of $525, and that officially ended Project Lewis. I caught my flight to Miami and successfully deposited a chunk of cash in the bank. But how much did we win? Well, I present to you the exciting trip data. Teammate one, amount of sessions, 26. Total amount of time played, 32 hours and 24 minutes. Average time per session, one hour and 15 minutes. Back offs, 15. Trespasses, one. Driving time, 46 hours. And winnings, $15,200. That worked out at $472 per hour played. Teammate two, Amount of sessions, 22. Total amount of time played, 128 hours and 36 minutes. That is a huge amount of time to get in on a trip like this. Average time per session, eight hours and 48 minutes. Back offs, four. Trespasses, zero. Driving time, 22 hours. 
winnings, $21,500, which is $167 per hour. Me, amount of sessions, 36. Total amount of time played, 53 hours and 48 minutes. Average time per session, one hour and 30 minutes, which is interesting because it's higher than my other teammate who isn't nearly as well known as I am. Back offs, 17. Trespasses, two. Driving time, 50 hours. Winnings, $32,800, which is $610 per hour. Notably, I had a $45,000 upswing. Look at that graph. Speaking of graphs, let's go to the team graph. We had a bit of a dip at the start, but recovered just as quickly. We then had a gradual incline with a small drop, but in general, a nice upward trend. Towards the last quarter of our playing time, we dipped a bit and then had a nice big win, a small drop, and then a lovely win to end. Our total winnings were $69,537. Our expenses were $15,996, meaning the overall profit was $53,514. Not bad for three weeks. It's been a good trip. I'm just gonna do this. You're doing three boxes? That's so rude. <laughs> All right, so we'll just play a few hands and I'll, I'll try and just verbalize my okay. brain. Yeah, yeah. And then I'll give you an idea. So would you mind just dealing this out how you would normally would? So I'm gonna wait for the second card to be dealt so I don't save myself some time because this is a plus one and a minus one, so I just ignore it. Mm -hmm. So I go D1, zero, one, two. I say D1 uh, because it's just quicker in my brain as opposed to going negative one, negative one, negative one. Right, okay. D just down, nice consonant say. So as I say, there's zero, D1, zero, one, two, two, two. That's a clip from a 55 minute interview I did on card counting. In it, I explain exactly what's going on in my head at the blackjack table. I also share a memory tool I like to use, stories and more. It was originally only available as part of a larger online event that cost $157 to attend. But you can now watch it on Nebula. Nebula is a streamy award nominated video platform built and run by content creators. And watching videos on Nebula really supports the people that make them. Nebula has over 14,000 videos from high quality creators, which basically means you can pick one at random and you know it's gonna be a good watch. You can watch all of the Beat the Odds videos on Nebula, as well as a couple of extra bonus videos you won't find here on YouTube. Not to mention all of the content on Nebula is ad free and sponsor free. So you get a seamless, uninterrupted viewing experience unless somebody else interrupts you, but that's really not Nebula's fault. There's only so much they can do.